I'm going to talk about how ideas get started. And Martin had asked me to tell you a little bit about DARPA, which is basically an idea factory. So what is DARPA? DARPA is the United States Military Classified Research Programs. It has a mission statement that is clear and concise. Ensure America's technology superiority forever. <clears throat> America wants to be on the leading edge. And one of the things that they discovered was that oversight is the death of innovation. Even though it's a government agency, it has virtually no over oversight. We don't have committees telling us what to do. We don't have people reviewing what we do. So, <clears throat> I have to confess I've got two fatal flaws. I'm addicted to high technology, and I'm a technology harvester. And that's why I'm here, a technology harvester who goes around the world looking for great new ideas, ideas that I never had, but ones that we could probably make happen if only you'd tell me about them. So, as we move forward, I'm not looking for anything to make anything better. I don't want to make a single thing better. I want to change things. And in so doing, things will be revolutionarily changed, and they will be much better because of it. The future ain't what it used to be. That categorizes what it's all about. We don't use the old and make it better, but we reinvent what the future should be. When Henry Ford was first asked <clears throat> uh, about when he, when he asked them what they want, they said they wanted a faster horse. That's not what they wanted. They wanted a faster form of transportation, so he invented the car. Many people think they know what they want, but deep down they can't express it. What we really need to do when we start looking for <clears throat> The answers to questions that people ask is, what functionality do you want? What is it that you want to make different or better? So, we have to reinvent medicine. My patients, as you see, have reinvented themselves. And it's not the same medicine as I was originally trained to do. So, one of the ways that we can do it is we can look at the new technologies in robots. And how can robots become creative? perhaps even more creative than humans. There may be a role for them, at least in the future, not to replace us, but to help us get better. Because we invent things through the, the scientific method. What is new since the 1800s, when it was first discovered, was that we have injected simulation between the design of your experiment and the actual conducting of it. This is the way a new idea might be generated, but within the scientific method. The big question is, where does the hypothesis come from? Where does the, the idea originate? Because science doesn't begin with an idea. It begins after the idea is conceived, and then you move forward. But where does the idea come from? Interestingly enough, if you look at it in the context of the way that we do science today, what we see is that in the real and physical world, you design your experiment, and you get a half a dozen or a dozen people together, and you actually perform that experiment. The number of subjects, n, is equal to 8. What simulation offers us is the opportunity, for example, in healthcare, to do a research project on a new medicine on a million patients with a 50-year follow-up over the weekend on a supercomputer. And you do it through simulation. And the number of patients that you examine, therefore, is not 8 or 10, but it's 100 million, because our computers will be able to process these. The importance about this is if any of you have read a book called The Black Swan, not the one about ballet, but the one about mathematics by Nassim Taleb. When you do these many experiments, every now and then, a few of them don't work. But you have 99.99% correct. Therefore, you say, we'll ignore these. What Nassim is telling us, those are the black swans. We don't explain why the things that don't fit in with our hypothesis, what their importance is. It turns out that if you look at these outliers, and you start using things like analogy and metaphor and so forth, you can come up with brand new ideas. These ideas were generated by the outliers, 
the ones don't fit the theory that you had to begin with. So, how do, else can we generate a new idea? One of the things that we discovered at DARPA was that everybody's looking at the 360 degree view. If we have a new idea, how do everybody else interact with it? The DARPA view is that we will look at this new idea, <coughs> uh, we will look at the way things are today and say, hmm, this is what we know must be true. This is the way we have to do something. We will assume that that's exactly the wrong way to do it. And we'll try to do the same function, but do it exactly the opposite way. If you have written, uh, have read Christian Clayton's book about disruptive technologies, where that term originally came from, every one of his examples are ones in which a well-known industry like IBM and huge computers went to small computers, disk drives, backhoes, all of these went from going from big down to small and personalized. So by taking what was known to be the conventional way that you should do this thing and doing exactly the opposite, figuring out a way to accomplish that, has been a very successful way to generate a new idea. So what are some of the things that are radically new? I'll show you some of the technologies that we have been working on and are or have already emerged. Not only did uh, DARPA begin with the first surgical robot, but it was an integrated system. The concept behind the robot is the robot's not a machine. It's an information system. It has arms, legs, eyes, and so forth. But basically, the important part of a robotic system is not the mechanical arms, but it's the information that is conveyed around. In healthcare, that importance means that by using a robotic system, I look at the monitor, it brings information to me. I touch something with my hand, it brings it to me. Or I move my hands, it moves the robot's arms, and the robot does something for me. I become an information manager. The information that comes in from the robot or the information from my hands to accomplish something when operating on the patient. Here is the operating room of the future, the operating room with no people. And what we did is we took that robotic system, but we combined it with a number of other systems that were out there that are used in industry today. So if I would say I need a uh, 2 0 chromic cat gut, it would reach in the cabinet, bring the gut to me, and then I would be able to use it. If I say change the scalpel in the right arm, it would grab the scalpel, remove the clamp from the robotic's arm, replace it with a clamp, and then be able to take it back. So we've been able to actually integrate the operating room in such a way that it becomes equivalent to what we see in industry. And why did we spend $25 million in the military to do this? Well, what we wanted to do was to change our combat casualty care from the golden hour, shrink it to the golden man minute, down, and down. bring the surgeon to man the back. wounded soldier. And so here is a concept video on how that would happen. The soldier is wounded, and one of our combat extraction vehicles, we have two of these, would scoop up the individual soldier, would put them inside of an armored operating room that would be right there on the battlefield. There is a smart bed underneath that sends information about the soldier back to the surgeon. We would scan to find out where the problem is, and then the surgeon would be able to remotely operate from wherever they happen to be. They can remove the clothing from it, and if they need to change tools, I showed you we have a tool changer, and if they need some supplies, like our new fibrin glue to stop the bleeding, we would be able to also supply that as well. And then, not only will we be using mechanical instruments, but we're moving more and more towards energy. Lasers, plasma, photons, to sterilize and seal wounds, and then when it's finished, be able to send them back at the closest unmanned air vehicle that happened to be in the area. That concept video was 1992. We built most of that system already. Nothing in that video didn't exist when we made it. It was just adapting the technologies that were available. One of the other things that DARPA uses is called a challenge, a $2 million prize for anybody who can, and you fill in the blank. The next challenge that we have right now is a rescue robot a humanoid robot for rescue operations, to actually go into dangerous places for firefighters or for soldier medics and so forth, and actually scoop up injured people and be able to move forward. This is an example of the next generation of robot that exists today. This is called Petman. 
It has no programming. It has a subsumptive architecture that's basically a form of intelligence. And you just tell this where to go or what to do, and he's actually able to do that. So where is the future? Well, here are some of the things. I can control things very well with my hands, but I, when it gets down to the microscopic level, I need help. And so this is a cockroach with a probe in their brain, and what it does is it runs on a treadmill, and we measure their brain pulse. And then we can see why this specific cockroach is able to be such an efficient motion machine. One evening, the students went back to the laboratory, disconnected the wire from the computer that was recording, hooked it to a joystick, and began driving my cockroach around the laboratory. Three and a half million dollars to drive a cockroach around the laboratory. But imagine if we took that little camera inside of your cell phone and put it on one of these cockroaches, and then we could send them to some disaster places like the Haitian uh, earthquake or the tsunami and find people that not only humans but even dogs can't fly today. We might have been able to actually save thousands of people. <clears throat> but this led to the next generation of bio-inspired. And so here's an example of a uh, moth that I've been able to fly around the laboratory, actually controlling that as well. And there have been clinical experiments that were first started on monkeys. This is a set of brain probes that you put inside the skull on the brain. And then it allows you to do a number of things like measure performance. This monkey here has the probe in his brain and it's being told that if it moves the red dot to touch the green dot, a robot arm will feed it. It takes about six weeks to interpret that. And then you did the same thing we did with the cockroach. We removed it from the computer and hooked it directly to the robotic arm. In the United States, we have five universities with monkeys sitting in front of monitors just thinking about eating and having a robot arm come and feed them. So our next generation of this is going to be an artificial arm for many of our soldiers that lost them and allow them to actually be able to move their arms with their thoughts. Here is a video of an individual who was paralyzed from the neck down, had a brain probe put into them, and then was now, as you can see, <coughs> able to draw a circle on a computer. He can turn the computer on and off just by thinking about it, change the channel, increase or decrease the volume. One of the students was so impressed, he snuck down to the laboratory where the hands were and brought one back and connected it and said, Mark, can you open and close this hand? It took 15 minutes, but you are now looking at the first video ever of a human to open and close a prosthetic hand simply using their thoughts. We are on our way. So, <clears throat> we are developing organs. Right now, we're growing synthetic organs for people that need transplants. And in the next generation, Tony Atala will begin making them, printing them with the organic stereolithographer. And you can see at one of the TED conferences, there's Tony in the lower corner, and the kidney that was next to him while he was giving the lecture, they were actually printing a living kidney. Uh, the future of 3D printing is enormous. Think of it. Think of your book that you have today, your electronic book. Think if you can not only send information of book to your Kindle, but you can send to your desktop on one of those replicators for 2,500 US dollars the program that will make for you any one of the things that you see there. So we're moving forward. We have to go through the science of these things that I've showed you to ensure the quality. However, no matter how certain that we are that they're going to work, there is always some unintended consequence. This is where we have experience to give a name to our mistakes. And the only thing more dangerous than trying to hard and failing is not trying hard enough, but succeeding. You'll never move on. So in the last two minutes, I'd like to tell you about incredible challenges new technologies are providing us in the healthcare field. As you see, business and technology is moving fast, but we are not looking at our moral and ethical issues. We have a moral dilemma. We failed initially when we wanted to determine what to do with human cloning. 190 of 193 nations forbade any research on human cloning. 
So we now have genetic engineering. We can gen engineer a child. If you have a disease that has a genetic origin, you can have another child that's genetically engineered take those and take this disabled child and make them perfectly normal. What happens if the mother doesn't want another child? Will this disabled child live disabled forever? Will the government have to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars every year for this person to stay disabled and not have the opportunity to be a normal person? We know how to extend the lifespan of mice for at least three times their normal lifespan. What happens if I gave this to your granddaughter? She now, when he's born, will live 200 years. Can we afford Social Security for 200 years? What happens if people don't die for 200 years? Can we feed the population? Incredibly difficult problems. I showed you I can replace almost any part of your body. What happens if I do? Are you still human? What is it that makes you human? Is it this flesh and blood, or is it something else? Will we discover the science of the soul? So these are the challenges that we have, and I think they're even more important than the technologies that I've showed you and many that I haven't. And so I'd like to conclude with what is the most challenging problem according to the President's Commission on Biomedical Engineering. And it is, for the first time in history, there walks on this planet a species so powerful that it can choose its own evolution at its own time and its own choosing. That species is Homo sapiens. This is a very, very impatient species. It will not wait. My friends, my colleagues, this is your generation. It is up to you to decide what will be the next species on this planet. That decision is up to you. Thank you very much.